you very much for the, the very kind introduction and for the invitation uh, to speak here today. Why are we talking about mosquitoes? So, like most of you probably know, uh, the mosquito is the world's deadliest animal, despite being such a tiny insect. And it's estimated that uh, mosquitoes claim the lives of more than 800,000 people every year. And this is, of course, not because of the mosquito bite itself, but because of what the, the pathogens that mosquitoes are transmitting during the bite, which you see happening here uh, in the movie. So uh, mosquitoes can um, transmit all kinds of pathogens like parasites, but also viruses. And um, these viruses we call arboviruses from arthropod-borne virus. Um, so there's more than 500 uh, arboviruses known to date. And um, of these, 130 are known to um, cause human disease. So like you can see in the table, it's actually a very diverse uh, group of viruses. So they belong to different virus families. Uh, but most arboviruses of public health uh, importance belong to three virus genera. And these are the flaviviruses, the alphaviruses, and the buniaviruses. What you can also see in the table is uh, that there's actually not only mosquitoes transmitting arboviruses, but also other um, arthropods can do that, like, for example, ticks and sandflies. So uh, mosquito-borne viruses uh, are, of course, transmitted by uh, mosquitoes to vertebrate hosts. So this can be humans, but also other uh, animals like birds, horses, uh, and, and other animals. Um, so these are the three main components of the transmission cycle of a mosquito-borne virus. But of course, there's many elements that can influence this uh, transmission cycle. And so it seems simple here in this um, drawing. But if you go to a real transmission cycle, like for example here of West Nile virus, you can see there's actually much more arrows. So there's a lot of elements that can influence these three components, uh, the virus, the vector, and uh, the vertebrate host. For example, uh, weather and climate are, are really important, uh, especially also for the mosquitoes, because they will influence how many um, mosquitoes will be um, be alive at a certain moment in, uh, in time. And this, of course, affects your uh, transmission. So it's actually a complicated process, and which makes it difficult to um, predict how much transmission there will be at a certain moment in a certain location. So why is it important that we talk about mosquito-borne viruses? So it's, first of all, a worldwide problem. So vector-borne diseases account for more than 17% of all infectious diseases. Uh, and here in the map, you can see um, the transmission of the three of the most um, prevalent arboviruses at the moment. So this is the uh, dengue virus, uh, chikungunya virus, and Zika virus. And you can see there's actually, they're present all over the world, also in more moderate uh, and, uh, temperate regions like in Europe and the United States. Um, and you can also see like in the light blue, there are the countries where these three viruses are circulating at the same time. So there's a lot of co-circulation as well. And we've also seen a growing number of arbovirus outbreaks. Um, this is, for example, due to climate change and international travel. That's mostly in the temperate regions. But also in regions where the viruses were already endemic, we also see more arbovirus outbreaks. And that has to do with, uh, to do with uh, increased urbanization and also with um, like growing uh, human populations in these, uh, in these regions. So if we focus on the Americas, we saw in 2022 that there were already more than 2,500,000 cases of arboviral disease that were diagnosed, so probably there's much more. And these were mostly dengue virus infections, but also chikungunya virus and, and Zika virus. So, and there were already more than 1,000 deaths uh, only uh, in this uh, region. So one of the reasons that uh, arboviruses are a worldwide problem is because of the invasion of these uh, vector species. And um, the most efficient um, mosquito species for most arboviruses are this, uh, these two ones here, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, or the tiger mosquito. And you can see in the map that they are uh, also uh, like, uh, distributed worldwide. So in red, you see the places where we have the tiger mosquito, in blue, Aedes aegypti, and in uh, orange, where they are both present. And if we focus on Europe, uh, we see that there, we only have a red color there, so only the tiger mosquito at the moment, with the exception of Madeira and the east of Turkey. And this is the most recent uh, map where we see the um, um, distribution of Aedes albopictus in, in Europe. And you can see where it's red, there's an established uh, population. And it's, of course, logically uh, mostly in the south of Europe, like in uh, Italy and, and Greece and the, the south of France. But we also see it in more um, northern countries, like in Germany or the, the north of France. And where it's yellow, there it's actually um, introduced, but not established yet. So for example, Belgium, where I'm from, which is uh, over here, in the middle, we only have uh, introductions of the tiger mosquito, but we expect that it will become established uh, quite soon. 
If you look at the United States, also there we have uh, alias mosquitoes, and this map shows uh, um, the regions where there's an uh, ability for the mosquitoes to live and reproduce. And you can see um, for the Aedes albopictus, it's, it's uh, in the east and the south of the country. And for Aedes aegypti, it's mostly the, the same, also a bit here in the southwest. So also here, there's the potential for invasion of, of Aedes mosquitoes. So besides the worldwide distribution, there's also a high disease burden because of these factor-borne diseases. And like I said in the beginning, there's more than 800,000 deaths because of factor-borne disease every year. But this also includes malaria, so that's not only because of the mosquito-borne viruses. Besides mortality, there is also high disease morbidity. And here there are some pictures you've probably seen before, like um, the microcephaly, which is induced by Zika virus and some other um, disease, um, um, diseases that we, I will discuss a bit more in detail. So I want to start with introducing dengue virus because that's the most widespread arbovirus uh, currently and actually one third of the world is at risk for a dengue virus infection. And you can see in the map which regions are of risk and these are of course the tropical and the subtropical regions where these Aedes mosquitoes are mostly present. So we have m around 400 million infections each year and of these there are 100 million people that will have symptoms because of it and around 20,000 deaths every year. So around 25% of people which uh, get a dengue infection will experience symptoms, and this is what we call dengue fever. So it's uh, characterized by a headache, fever of course, skin rash, and also myalgia and arthralgia. But then uh, around 5% of these people will develop severe dengue, and that's when it becomes dangerous and, and people can actually die of, of the dengue virus infection. And this can be either a dengue hemorrhagic fever but, or also a dengue shock syndrome, which is uh, characterized by these symptoms over here. And we see an increased risk, risk for severe disease, especially when people get a secondary infection, uh, because dengue virus has several serotypes. So there's four serotypes, and when you, when you get a second infection, with a different serotype, there's actually the risk of getting more severe disease than when you get a second infection with the same serotype. And this has to do with antibody-dependent enhancement, but I will not go into much detail there, but it's uh, also affecting, for example, vaccine efficacy. efficacy. So a related virus to dengue virus is Zika virus, and it's um, a person that gets a Zika virus infection actually experiences uh, similar symptoms, also fever, skin rash, and so on. And there's one particular symptom that's more uh, specific for Zika virus, and that's the conjunctivitis. So not mo many people will actually have uh, symptoms of a Zika virus infection, uh, not many adults, but there can be a severe neurological complications. For example, there can be um, the induction of Guillain-Barré syndrome, where um, the immune system will be starting to damage the myelin of the, of the neurons, and you can get uh, paralyzed. And then best known is, uh, of course, uh, what happens when a, a pregnant woman gets infected with Zika virus and the virus can be transmitted to the, the fetus and then you can have um, congenital Zika syndrome, which uh, mostly is um, characterized by this fetal microcephaly. So these babies are um, having a smaller brain and are, have, of course, uh, very severe symptoms and they don't uh, become that, uh, that old. Then a last virus I want to introduce um, is the chikungunya virus. And this is not a flavivirus like the two previous viruses, but it's an alpha virus. And uh, what's a bit special about this virus is actually almost everybody that's get infected with chikungunya virus will have symptoms. So this is different from uh, most other mosquito-borne viruses where adults will be uh, asymptomatic. But the symptoms are quite similar. So again, there's fever, fatigue, headaches, skin rash, and uh, joint pains uh, with chikungunya disease. What's also special about chikungunya virus and some other alpha viruses is that um, we see in around 40% of the infected people that they will develop a chronic disease. And this chronic disease is also uh, characterized by these episodes of chronic arthralgia and it's apparently very painful because these people, they cannot, they cannot open a bottle of water, they cannot lace their shoes, they cannot go down from the stairs. So it's all simple things, but if this happens to you and it's always very painful, it has a, a big impact on the quality of your life. So although it's not a, a really deadly virus, it, has a, it causes a lot of human suffering and also a lot of economic costs. And this chronic disease can actually stay for years after the initial infection. So chikungunya virus is the most widespread alpha virus uh, at the moment. You can see it's uh, present uh, almost all over the world. Also in Europe, we had um, outbreaks of chikungunya virus, especially in Italy. But there's other alpha viruses uh, in different regions of the world. For example, the Ross River virus, which also induces arthritis, is uh, yeah, circulating mostly in Australia. We have uh, an, an alpha virus in the north of Europe, which is uh, the Sindis virus. 
But also in the United States, we have several alpha viruses, and these are mostly the equine encephalitis viruses, like uh, the Western equine encephalitis virus and the Eastern equine encephalitis virus. And these uh, are really bad viruses. They can cause fever and headache, but most importantly, they can cause a neuroinvasive disease. And this is characterized by seizures, encephalitis, myelitis, and meningitis. And especially for the Eastern equine encephalitis virus, the case fatality rate is quite high. It's 30%. If you survive the infection, in 50% of these people, there will be neurological sequelae. So, not a good virus to get. So, besides these uh, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, there's other uh, domestic arboviruses in the United States. So, there's several mosquito-borne viruses, and the one that's causing the most cases is the West Nile virus. But there's others like the St. Louis encephalitis virus, La Crosse virus, and the Jamestown Kenya virus. And there's also tick-borne viruses, but I will not talk uh, too much about ticks today uh, because I'm a mosquito person. But so there's the Poisson virus, which is also causing several cases every year in the United States. So mosquito-borne virus infections are mostly acute infections or so self-limiting. And uh, after the mosquito bite, when the virus is deposited in the skin, there will be um, yeah, replication and dissemination to other organs. And there will be a viremia, which is usually quite short, uh, three to seven days, depending on the virus. And then, like I already said, most of the times there's uh, no symptoms, but uh, yeah, also here, depending on the virus. If there are symptoms, they appear like two to 14 days after the mosquito bite. So because of the short viremia, it's uh, very difficult to um, diagnose an acute infection with mosquito-borne viruses. And, and it's also difficult based, uh, to do this based only on the symptoms, um, because most of the symptoms are as specific. So you can see this, for example, in the drawing here. There are some of the typical symptoms for a mosquito-borne virus infection. But you can see that there's actually a lot of viruses that cause these uh, same symptoms. So, so purely based on symptoms, it's it's not feasible to say, especially in a region where several arboviruses are circulating, it's not possible to diagnose based on that. Of course, there are diagnostic tests, and there are molecular diagnostic tests that will be very uh, specific for a certain virus. So these are these direct detection methods. So they have high sensitivity and high specificity, but because of this short viremia, you cannot use them uh, in a very long time. So this you can see over here, it's a bit similar to the previous graph I showed. So the short viremia will allow the viral detection, but it's only uh, in a very short period. So most of the diagnostics actually depend on antibody detection. But there we have the problem that a lot of these um, arboviruses, they share, um, they're very similar in their um, uh, antigens. So there we will have a lot of cross-reactivity. So we can use them for a longer period of time, but then they're um, less specific. So actually, the diagnosis of a mosquito-borne virus infection is usually missed in a clinical practice. And for example, in Africa, it's thought that most arbovirus infections are actually not um, recognized at all, and they're misdiagnosed for malaria. So there's a, a huge underestimation of the number of arbovirus infections uh, in, in Africa. So what are now the strategies that we have to control mosquito-borne virus infections? There's actually three pillars. So we have the vector control based on on the mosquitoes. Um, we have, of course, vaccines and antiviral drugs. So I will start with the mosquito control. And to understand mosquito control strategies, you have to know a bit about the mosquito life cycle. So you can see here that there is actually four life stages of a, a mosquito. So we first have the eggs. Um, they will develop into larvae. There's four stages of that. And then we have the pupae. And then out of the pupae, there will be adult mosquitoes emerging. And so you see that three of the four life stages of a mosquito are in the water. And that's important for mosquito control because mosquitoes lay their eggs in still, uh, in standing water. And this can be a very small um, uh, amounts of water. So they don't need like a whole pool to put their eggs in. It's just like a little bit of water can be enough. So if you're in the summer, you have some um, things outside like um, your barbecue or some uh, kids' toys or the, the kids' swimming pool. These are like prime locations for the mosquitoes to put their eggs. So if there's a little bit of water, they will be able to, to lay their eggs there and you will have a lot of mosquitoes um, a week later. So if you want to have less mosquitoes around your house, check uh, the standing water and remove it. There's, of course, also personal protection measures you can take. So there's insect repellents you can apply protective clothes, so wearing uh, long sleeves uh, and pants with long sleeves, and also, of course, like screens before your windows to protect, yeah, to avoid that the mosquitoes get into your house. 
Besides that, there are insecticides. Um, so you can spray insecticides when there's an outbreak to do um, vector control, but you can also impregnate uh, these mosquito nets with insecticides uh, to kill the mosquitoes. So this is, can be very efficient, but unfortunately there's a lot of insecticide resistance and this is a, a growing problem. So all the exist, uh, insecticides that we're using to date, uh, the mosquito is actually able to um, become resistant to it. And here in this map you see um, places where they tested mosquito populations of uh, Aedes aegypti uh, in bioassays to see how well they still respond to certain insecticides. And the more red the color, the less susceptible the adult mosquitoes are for the insecticide. And you can see there's a lot of orange and red in, in South America and, and in Asia. And what's also um, clear from this um, um, map is that in Africa there's actually not much uh, known about the insecticide resistance in mosquito populations because there's not been a lot of tests done. So it's actually very important to monitor your mosquito populations to see how well they still respond to the insecticides. And there's a lot of um, like, uh, research going on to go into new strategies for vector control. I'm not going to talk about that today because that's not my specialty, but there's people that are genetically modifying uh, mosquitoes and so on. So it's really interesting research and a lot of it is happening in that field. Then the vaccines, of course, yeah, we know vaccines are a really um, good uh, way to prevent uh, infections. We have seen that with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. And um, so, of course, for mosquito-borne virus infections, vaccines could also be very useful, but unfortunately, we don't have many. So the, the best known and, and the oldest vaccine, actually, for mosquito-borne viruses is the yellow fever uh, virus vaccine, which is a, a live attenuated vaccine that was made by passaging the virus on a chicken tissue. And this is actually a vaccine that you only need to administer once. So it's a very efficient uh, vaccine, but it also has some problems. So it requires a cold chain because it's a live vaccine. And that's not a problem here in the United States or in Europe, but it can be a problem in places like in, in Africa and Asia, where you have to go to remote um, locations and you have to bring a va vaccine in a cold chain to these places. So that's really not uh, evident. Um, there's also a difficult production process because it's still made in um, sterilized eggs. So that's also not so easy. You have to control every batch uh, that you make. And there's also, you cannot use it for immunocompromised people. Then there's also a dengue virus vaccine, uh, the dengue vaccine, and it's actually based on the yellow fever vaccine. So it uses the yellow virus vaccine as a backbone, and then they made chimeric viruses uh, in this backbone. And because there are uh, four serotypes, it's a tetravalent vaccine. So they made uh, chimeric viruses for all four serotypes. But although it's a live vaccine, it's still three doses that are needed. And they've also found out in the phase three trials when the, um, that were still being analyzed after the vaccine was actually already approved, that it um, can only be used for seropositive persons because people that didn't have a dengue virus infection yet, when they were vaccinated with dengvaxia, they saw that they actually were more prone to severe disease than the people that were not vaccinated. So now the WHO recommends that people are tested for their zero status of dengue infection. But that's, of course, not so easy because the diagnostic methods are not so very good. So um, actually, the vaccine is not so used so widely as people thought it would be, be used. And then the last uh, virus for which we have vaccines is the Japanese encephalitis virus. And there we actually have two uh, vaccines, a live one and an inactivated vaccine. But there's, of course, a lot of vaccines in clinical development as well, especially for chikungunya virus, Zika virus, and dengue virus. And then coming to the antiviral drugs, so the last uh, strategy that we have to control uh, mosquito-borne virus infections. And we have actually antiviral drugs for several uh, viruses. And the first antiviral drug was developed for herpes virus. And we also have antivirals like, you know, for HIV, for hepatitis B virus, C virus, and SARS-CoV-2 now as well. But unfortunately, we don't have any antiviral drug yet for mosquito-borne viruses. And I think an antiviral would actually be very useful uh, to have. So what we do in our uh, institute in, in Leuven is to look for these potent antiviral drugs. So we do that for uh, several viruses, but also for uh, mosquito-borne viruses. And the way we do that is uh, by doing a phenotypic screening. So we will screen large collections of molecules with an unknown activity. So this can be natural products, but also synthetic molecules. And we do antiviral testing on cells, and we will look for a certain uh, phenotype that's induced by the virus. And usually we look for the cytopathogenic effects. And you can see that over here. So you see here um, viral cells, which are monkey kidney cells in a monolayer. So they're looking um, 
quite healthy, but when you infect them with a, a virus like chikungunya virus, for example, you see that the monolayer is destroyed and the cells are, are dying. They're starting to get a, a round shape and not feeling very well. So this CVE we can measure in several ways. We can do a colorimetric assay. We can also just simply um, fix the cells and then color them with methylene blue. And when the, uh, the virus has infected the cells and killed the cells, of course, there's no monolayer to, to color. So this you can nicely see in this 384 well plate where we have the virus control where all the, the wells are empty because there's just no cells left. And then there's a cell control where th there was no virus, so there the cells are healthy. And in all these wells here, we had uh, one compound being um, tested. And you can see there was actually one hit on this plate. So one um, compound that was able to inhibit the virus and, and uh, make sure that the cells survived. So this is a way of uh, screening for a lot of compounds uh, with antiviral activity. There's another uh, way that we also use is uh, by using fluorescent reporter viruses. And then you can um, measure the, the fluorescent signal to find uh, molecules with antiviral activity. So for arboviruses, we don't have any antiviral drug yet, but there are antiviral drugs in clinical development. And the most advanced one is a drug for dengue virus. And actually, oh yeah, I forgot about to talk about this one. So uh, I also want to highlight an infrastructure we have uh, at our institute, and it's uh, the, called the CAPSID. So it's a high biosafety lab in a box uh, infrastructure. So you can see it from the outside here. It's in our BSL-3 facility. Uh, and this is on the inside. So we actually have uh, like... Um, different equipment inside this box. Um, so we have high content imagers, cell incubators, robotic arms that can move plates around and, and multi dispensers. So we can screen a lot of compounds in this lab in the box and we don't need actually humans to be present. So it can run like every hour in a day, seven days a week. We only have to bring in the cells, the virus and the molecules and then it will be put in plates and the plates will be put in the incubator and then at certain time points that you can program, it will, a robotic arm will take out the plate, put it in an, in an imager or in another um, yeah, instrument to, to measure uh, virus uh, infection. So there's um, some nice movies about this infrastructure if you're interested, and you can also find this on the website of our institute. I don't have time to show it today, unfortunately. So one of the uh, inhibitors that is in clinical development is uh, an inhibitor for dengue virus. And the most advanced one is in phase two clinical trials. And actually this uh, molecule was uh, discovered originally in our institute by one of my colleagues, uh, Suzanne Captain, And she screened uh, about 30,000 molecules against dengue virus two. And she came up with one very good hit, which is shown over here, which had nice activity against dengue virus two, a bit less against the other serotypes. So what we do then is we work together with medicinal chemists and they start to make analogs of the compound. So they will look at the chemical structure and identify certain side groups. And then they start putting other groups there. And so they make a lot of analogs and we test them again in our antiviral assay. And in that way, after several rounds of uh, making new analogs and optimizing the structure, we come to something that is actually more potent uh, against several um, serotypes. And this ended up with um, uh, resulting in this molecule over here, the JNJAO7 molecule, which is actually very potent. So you see here the EC50 values, which is the concentration that is needed to inhibit 50% of the, the virus replication. And they're really uh, low. So it's in the nanomolar and picomolar range. And for somebody who um, yeah, knows uh, about antiviral research, you know that this is very, a very potent molecule. And it's also working against a lot of clinical isolates of all the different serotypes. Besides that, it's not also not only working in viral cells, which is like a typical cell line that we use for uh, antiviral research, but also in more clinically relevant cells like H87 cells or dendritic cells, and also it, it works in mosquito cells. So it was an, a very nice um, inhibitor to find, uh, but we wanted to know uh, what is the antiviral target of this um, molecule? How is it uh, actually inhibiting dengue virus? To figure that out, we um, did an in vitro resistance selection um, um, experiments. So we start, um, we infect cells with the wild type virus and we start passaging the virus in the presence of uh, the compound with the increasing concentrations. And then every five passages we, um, we measured if this virus was still susceptible to the antiviral molecule and we also did some sequencing to see if there were changes in the, in the viral genome. So and what we found, you can see over here in this graph, so this is the the passage number in weeks, and this is the EC50. So the lower the EC50, the more potent your compound is. And this is uh, the percentage of your virus population. 
And what you can see is that it actually took a long time to get to a, a certain level of resistance. So we had to passage for 15 weeks, which is a, a long time in uh, antiviral research, to get a bit of an increase in, in, in the EC50, and that was due to um, the emergence of one resistance mutation. But then uh, it took even more weeks to get to a fully resistant virus, so up to 35 weeks. And this uh, required the presence of these uh, four mutations, and they were all present in the same viral protein, which is the NS4B, which is shown over here. And you can see in, um, in orange the different mutations and where they are present in the, the viral protein structure. So actually we saw that uh, this molecule has a very high barrier to resistance because it requires multiple mutations and it took a long time to get to this mutation. So this is a really good feature for an antiviral drug. So we also, of course, wanted to know if this molecule was acting uh, uh, as an antiviral drug in vivo, because you can have something really good in vitro in a cell line, but that's, of course, not giving you any uh, guarantee that it will work in a, in a mouse model or even in humans. So for dengue, we use a mouse model in AG129 mice, which are immunodeficient mice, and they get a, a quite efficient replication of dengue virus uh, in these mice when you infect them IP or, or subcutaneously. And so here you see a survival curve. So we infected the mice with dengue virus and starting treatment at the time of infection. And we used several doses. Um, so in red, you see the vehicle group, and we had to utilize the first mice at day five uh, post-infection. And then at the end of the study, almost all the mice had to be utilized. But then if you look at the treated uh, mice, uh, especially with the higher concentrations, it was very efficient in um, making sure that the virus could not um, make the, the mice sick. So it was a very uh, potent uh, yeah, result here to inhibit the mortality. But this was, of course, treatment at the time of infection, and we all know that this is not happening in real life. You will never start treating a patient at the moment that the patient gets infected. So we wanted to know if this um, antiviral would also work if the, the mice were already infected, and especially when peak pharemia was almost there, because that's the time that patients will get symptoms, so when they will go to the doctor and might get a treatment. So my colleague, she did a lot of mouse studies and, and she started a treatment uh, at several time post, uh, points post-infection. And I will focus especially on these three groups that started uh, later in the infection. So at uh, day four, five and six post-infection. So for example, here in the left graph, you can see, it, so in red is a vehicle group. So you see uh, the varemia going up and then it will go down again um, by itself because it's a self-limiting infection also in, in this uh, um, yeah, so the varemia will go down, but the, the mice in the end will still get sick. But here at day four, we start the treatment and you see that the um, virus levels go up. But then at the moment you start the treatment, it immediately we see that the virus uh, loads are going down in the serum. So it's a, an, a direct effect, actually. And the same thing happened when we started at day five post-infection. So the virus going up until day five. And then again, it was still dropping faster than the untreated group was doing. At day six post-infection, that was at the peak of the varemia. Of course, there the effect was not that large, but still it went down still a bit faster than, than in the untreated group. So this shows that actually an antiviral drug would still be useful if you start treatment very close to the peak varemia. So this is a, a molecule that is uh, in phase two clinical trials. So that's the most advanced uh, antiviral drug for an arbovirus. And I hope uh, it will still prove to be effective in humans as well in, the, in these clinical trials. So what's also interesting about this NS4B protein uh, for flaviviruses is it seems to be a hotspot for inhibitors so because there were many other groups that described uh, inhibitors that are targeting the NS4B so for different viruses, for dengue virus and also for yellow fever virus. So it seems to be like a kind of Achilles heel for, for the flaviviruses. And we've seen this for other virus families, for example, for enteroviruses. There we always find capsid inhibitors. Oh, now it's going, it's running itself. Okay, so we find a lot of capsid inhibitors, for example, and for flavivirus, we, we find always these NS4B inhibitors. And there's actually another uh, molecule that's in clinical development. It's in phase one studies now, and it's a molecule developed by Novartis, which is, it's called the NITD688. It's also pan serotype and also targeting the NS4B protein. Um, and here you see um, results of a mouse study where they um, measured dengue virus RNA in, in the serum. And you can see, especially in the BID treatment group, there's quite a, a good reduction of the, the virus replication when these mice were treated with the, with the molecule. So there's two NS4B inhibitors that are now in, in clinical development. 
For other viruses, there's not much going on, unfortunately. For chikungunya virus, there's one monoclonal antibody in phase one studies. Um, so here you can see um, data in vitro in a cell line where they tested uh, three antibodies uh, with a, a nice inhibitory effect against chikungunya. And they also tested this in a mouse model. So you can see here when treatment started at day one post-infection, there was a good reduction of the virus in the spleen and also in the hind leg because yeah, chikungunya is a virus that infects the joints. So it's important to look at, to measure the virus in, in the joints. And also when treatment was started at day three post-infection, so also at the peak uh, viremia uh, of the virus in the mouse model, there was still a good inhibition, especially with the highest uh, concentration. So this is also um, promising, but of course an antibody that is not something that can be used like, like widely in, in, in certain regions. It's yeah, you have to uh, give it IV. Um, it's not something that we can give as a as a, a, a therapy for many people, I'm afraid. So it would be better to have a small molecule that can be given uh, orally. Uh, and so there, we're not there yet for chikungunya virus, unfortunately. What could be a good target for, uh, for chikungunya virus is the NSP1 protein. So this is an enzyme that's responsible for the capping of the viral RNA. And what is uh, special about alpha viruses is that they use an unconventional capping pathway. So that means that they will not use the same pathway as the, the host mRNAs that are being kept. So it goes a bit differently. And so that could make it a good antiviral target because if you inhibit that capping pathway, you will probably not inhibit the capping of the host mRNAs. So this is something we found in, in our lab is that uh, we found the first NSP1 inhibitors for chikungunya virus. And here you can see uh, this first molecule that we described in 2016, which had a very nice activity in vitro, but unfortunately it had a low barrier to resistance. So we only needed one mutation to have a fully resistant virus and it popped up really quickly. So that's not so favorable. Um, even if for an acute infection, I think it would not be so useful. But we also found another molecule and it's actually um, chemically, it looks very different from the previous one. And there we had a higher barrier to resistance. We needed also four mutations to get a fully resistant virus. So this one is actually, I think, more promising than this uh, MADDP class. But uh, unfortunately, um, the PK uh, is not good at the moment of these molecules, so we cannot test it in vivo yet. So we are working with the chemists to, to make these molecules better so that we could also test them in our mouse model. But uh, So there's no proof yet that NSP1 would actually be a good target uh, in vivo. And then there was also another group that found uh, NSP1 inhibitors, again, a very different chemical structure. And what was interesting is that the mutations that they found they were very different from the mutations that we found for these other two classes. So there was no cross resistance, meaning that there's actually two spots in this NSP1 protein that can be inhibited by uh, antiviral molecules. So I think this is a really uh, uh, exciting um, um, antiviral hotspot for, uh, for um, antiviral drug development. So I think these two classes, they, the NS4B inhibitors and the NSP1 inhibitors, they show that we can actually find good antiviral molecules for mosquito-borne viruses, but they're also very specific for only one virus. So the dengue inhibitor, the JNJ compound, is only working against dengue, and these NSP1 inhibitors, they only work for chikungunya. So that's not so, such a good idea to have a, a molecule that's only for one virus because we cannot develop antivirals for all the arboviruses because there's more than 130 that are known to cause human disease. So it's just not realistic to, to start developing antivirals for all of them. So what would be a better strategy is uh, to develop these broad spectrum antivirals. So to have something that uh, inhibits like all viruses of one virus family or even more uh, virus families. And so there are some antivirals already known that have a broad spectrum antiviral activity. And I will give two examples. Um, so uh, one that's very well known is favipiravir or T705. And that's a molecule that's approved in Japan to treat uh, pandemic influenza virus infections. And so it's a molecule that looks like this. It's a very small molecule. It's um, resembling a nucleobase. So it needs to get the ribo, uh, uh, um, the sugar and the triphosphates to actually be working in the cell and to inhibit um, virus replication. So when it gets these um, triphosphate and um, uh, sugar group, it will be recognized like a nucleoside analog uh, by the viral polymerase and it will be built in in the viral genome while it's uh, being replicated. And when it's being built in, it will actually cause metagenesis because it will be, uh, there will be ambitious pa base pairing. So it can pair both with a cytidine and a uridine. So it will induce mutations. And if there's too many mutations in your viral genome, the virus will not be um, able to, um, to be infectious and it will be lethal. 
Um, well, it's also thought that Faripiravir could do, um, induce chain termination, so that just the, the RNA chain will be stopped. But actually, most people have shown that it's by lethal metagenesis. What's also nice about Favipiravir is that there's a high barrier for resistance. So for influenza virus, um, it has not been used so much because it's only for pandemic flu, but at least in, in uh, so the patients that were treated and also in um, in vitro cell culture systems, they were not able to easily select for resistant viruses. And we saw the same thing actually for chikungunya virus. So Favipiravir doesn't only work for influenza virus, but for a very big group of viruses. And we showed in our lab that favipiravir actually works very nicely in our chikungunya virus mouse model, which you can see over here. So here you see in um, the open uh, circles, they show the treated groups and you can see there's no virus replication, uh, for example, in the, the hands and the wrists of the mice. And we also don't find any virus in the serum. So it's a very efficient molecule, at least in our mouse model. So this could be promising for several mosquito-borne virus infections. And another good example is uh, the EIDD1931 uh, molecule, uh, which is actually improved as a prodrug uh, for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2, and that's uh, known as molnipiravir. So, and that molecule also has a broad-spectrum antiviral activity against uh, several alpha viruses and some other viruses. Um, so it's also causing lethal mutagenesis. So it's the same mechanism of action as favipiravir. So it's also resembling a nucleoside analog, and it will be incorporated in your viral genome when it's being replicated. And for alpha viruses, they actually showed uh, that it works in a mouse model. So here you see results with the uh, Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus with different concentrations. And this is a survival curve. So it shows when the mice needed to be euthanized. And in the fecal group, yeah, they had to be euthanized between day six and seven. But when they were treated with several um, different concentrations of the molecule, the, the mice survived. So very potent molecule. And also when they did a delay of treatment, so when they start treatment at 24 hours post-infection or 48 hours post-infection, there was still an effect of the molecule. So this shows that there are also antiviral drugs that have a broad spectrum antiviral activity that might be useful for mosquito-borne virus infection treatment. So if we would have an effective, anti effective antiviral therapy, this should lower the viral load in the serum and the organs. And it has been shown for several uh, mosquito-borne viruses that the viral load is actually linked to the severity of the symptoms. So if you can come in with an antiviral drug in time and you can lower the viral load, you will also be able to reduce the symptoms. And what's also, uh, what these antivirals will also do, they will lower transmission by the mosquito vectors because mosquitoes need a certain amount of virus in the blood to become infected and then transmit to a new person. So if you can have an antiviral drug in time, it will also affect the transmission and probably how big your outbreak is in a certain region. But there's a problem uh, because the varemia is so short, also the treatment window will be quite limited. You have to come in in time with your antiviral drug, uh, uh, if possible in the, when the varemia is still going up, but also the symptoms will only appear when there's a, quite a lot of virus. So most people will only go to see a doctor when they actually are at their peak of varemia, or even later when they still are experiencing uh, symptoms uh, after the febrile stage, but then actually the virus is already eliminated by the immune system. So if you then come in with an antiviral drug inhibiting the virus itself, it will not do much anymore. So to, be, um, to have an effective antiviral therapy, we actually need early diagnosis. So, and this is at the moment, like I told you in the beginning of my talk, still a problem. So how can we use this antiviral drug? So um, what would be an option is pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this can be travel associated like we do for malaria. So if somebody travels to an endemic region, this person can be start to take treatment some days before traveling and then during the, the presence in this endemic region. But then of course the molecule has to be very safe because you give it as a prophylaxis. Another option is household prophylaxis, because we see that mosquitoes that are, are born in a certain place, they will not uh, fly away so far. So they will only travel like 100 to 200 meters from the place where they were like uh, emerging from the pupae in the water. So if there's one person infected in a household, it's, uh, there's a big likelihood that the infected mosquito is around and that the other people are also at risk. And also this infected person can infect new mosquitoes in, in, the, in the neighborhood. So then it could be an idea that if this person is diagnosed with an infection, that you start treating the people that live in the same household uh, so that, they can, uh, that there is a prevention of them of getting infected too. So I think this shows that we can develop antiviral drugs, but we have to think about how we will use them. And the classical way of using antiviral drugs 
will maybe be difficult for mosquito borne viruses. So I think it's um, also important to look uh, to think about new strategies to fight arbovirus infections, and that's actually what we try to do in, in my lab. So in the last uh, like 10 minutes of my talk, I want to um, focus a bit on what we are at the moment doing in my team. So we try to focus on um, all elements of the uh, virus transmission cycle and to try to develop new strategies. And what one of my students is doing is looking at Belgian mosquito diversity and to test uh, the Belgian mosquitoes for their factor competence for viruses that could be circulating uh, in Belgium. So this is mostly West Nile virus and Usutu virus. Um, so I also have um, people that work on the role of the mosquito microbiome in arbovirus transmission, but it, because it has been shown that bacteria in the mosquito can actually affect um, the transmission of certain viruses. And also there's a lot of insect specific viruses that we are now like discovering in mosquitoes. And some of these insect specific viruses can also affect uh, whether an arbovirus is being transmitted or not. Yeah, since I work a lot on antiviral drugs, we also now uh, try to study if antiviral drugs have an effect inside the mosquito. And I will come back in a bit more detail um, in the next slides about that. And we also have a project where we look at the human skin uh, microbiome uh, in arbovirus infections. So coming first to the antiviral drugs in the mosquitoes. So what is the idea behind that? We, of course, we don't want to treat mosquitoes itself. That uh, would be silly. But we were thinking that if there would be an antiviral drug approved uh, for uh, a an, an mosquito-borne virus, so people will be taking the drug and the drug will be present in the blood of this person for a certain period of time. So if mosquitoes will be biting these treated humans, they will ingest the drug uh, in, during the blood feeding and the drug will be present in the mosquito midgut, which is shown over here. So that's the stomach of the mosquito. So we were wondering if this antiviral drug is being ingested with the blood, can it actually reduce virus replication efficiently and also affect virus transmission? So how do we study this? We uh, infect mosquitoes with a, an artificial blood meal. So we give them um, we mostly use rabbit blood for Aedes aegypti and we mix it with a virus and then it's put in such a feeder system that will heat the blood to 37 degrees. We put it on top of a mosquito cage like you can see over here. Then the mosquitoes will, uh, will be taking up the blood meal and then these mosquitoes are put in an incubator and we keep them for a certain amount of time until we want to analyze the virus replication. And we uh, look actually at three parameters. We have the infection rate where we look at how much mosquitoes are getting infected. So for that, we look at the mosquito body. We also look at the dissemination rate, which shows how much of the virus can actually escape from the stomach of the mosquito to go to other parts. And this is important because uh, the virus has to go to the salivary glands of the mosquito to then be transmitted in the saliva. So this is the dissemination rate. And then finally, we'll also look in the saliva. So we will uh, take off the legs and the wings of the mosquito and put the proboscis in a filter tip. And then uh, the mosquito will actually spit the saliva in this filter tip. And we can then measure in the saliva if there's infectious virus or not. So this gives an idea of uh, whether the virus can be transmitted or not. So we did already some experiments with several inhibitors. And I will show you the data with a dengue inhibitor. So what we did first was to infect mosquitoes with dengue virus and have the antiviral molecule there at the same time. So at the time of infection. So and then we looked at the mosquito bodies and uh, at the infection rate and we saw actually that with the um, three of the four concentrations that we tested, there was a complete block of virus replication in the mosquito bodies. And only at the lowest concentration of 20 nanomolar, there we again had um, mosquito bodies that were infected. We also looked at the dissemination rate, so whether the virus could spread to the heads and the salivary glands. And also there we saw that um, the three uh, highest concentrations could completely block dissemination of the virus. And uh, with a lower concentration, there was still some dissemination, but it was actually um, lower than for the untreated uh, group. So this shows that uh, an antiviral drug can actually have a potent uh, antiviral effect inside the mosquito against dengue virus. But of course, again, he, uh, we will probably not have mosquitoes that are being infected and being exposed to an antiviral drug at the same time. So that's not a really realistic scenario. So we wanted to know if uh, mosquitoes are first exposed to the drug and then being infected in a second blood meal, if there would still be an effect. So we gave a blood meal with the antiviral drug and then six days post this blood meal, we gave another blood meal with the dengue virus. And then we looked at infection rate and again, we were actually surprised by this result. There was a full uh, inhibition of uh, dengue virus replication in the mosquitoes. So even if the molecule was already there for six days, it was still able to work. 
So another thing we wanted to study is um, whether there would still be an effect if the mosquito was already infected. So for this we use a new model that we are developing at the moment and that's a mosquito midgut model. So we take out the mosquito uh, midguts and then we can culture them in 96 well plates for around seven days. And like you could see on the movie, um, it actually keeps um, moving in the plate. Um, so there's peristalsis and we can measure that um, by um, recording it with a video and then put a software on it. So then we can see how many contractions there are in, in a certain period of time. And we can also, of course, infect these uh, ex vivo midguts with several arboviruses and also with dengue virus. So, and we use this uh, mosquito midguts to then test the effect of the antiviral drug. So here you can see the data and these are genome copies of dengue virus in the midguts and um, this is uh, when we um, insert the molecule there at the time of the infection again there was a complete inhibition of dengue virus replication but then we also wanted to know what if the midguts are already infected and we come in with the drug later so we did one day and three days post infection and even at three days post infection when the replication of the virus is already quite established there's still inhibition. There's no full inhibition anymore, but like three out of seven midguts were still, there was no replication. So we were actually quite happy with this. So this shows that um, probably when a mosquito is already infected and it can then gets exposed to the antiviral, there would still be a certain level of inhibition. Then going to the last part of my talk, that's about the role of, of human skin bacteria in arbovirus infection. So why uh, skin bacteria? So the skin is of course the first uh, a place where the mosquito worm virus will start replicating because this is where, where the mosquito is depositing the virus in the saliva. And it will um, encounter a lot of uh, cells there, our human uh, immune cells as well. But there's also a quite rich skin microbiome um, in, in humans. So we have, no, we, we have seen for other viruses that these uh, bacteria of humans, they can actually affect the uh, outcome of a, a virus infection and virus induced disease a, a lot, especially for respiratory viruses that have been shown that uh, human bacteria can decrease virus infection. And uh, in yeah, the other way around, actually, for enteric viruses like norovirus and poliovirus, there it has been shown that host bacteria can actually enhance virus infection. So this shows that there is a lot of interactions between bacteria and, and viruses, but there is actually nothing known about the skin bacteria and mosquito-borne viruses infections. So that's why we thought it would be interesting to start uh, studying this. And we started with in vitro studies because that's more easy. And what we did was we used these bacterial cell wall components because it's very difficult in a virology lab to start working with live bacteria because it contaminates your cell cultures and nobody likes that, that you come in with your with bacteria in a virology lab. So we started to work with cell wall components instead. So we worked with LPS, also pe peptidoglycans and lipotechic acid. And we started first by incubating these cell wall components with different uh, arboviruses, um, both alpha viruses and flaviviruses. And we noticed that some of them actually had a um, in, induce a, a big effect on the infectivity and we did a lot of experiments to show how it worked and uh, in the end we could say that there was a direct viricidal effect. Um, so this means that the LPS is actually um, disturbing the, the morphology of your virus particle and you can see this here very clearly in this electron microscopy um, images. So this is the LPS alone and this is um, Semliki forest virus which is an alpha virus. Uh, so when you start incubating this virus with the LPS, you see after a certain amount of time that the virus particle is really disturbed and then in the end we don't find any virus particles at all anymore. So this and other experiments showed that the LPS was actually having a direct virucidal effect on our virus particles. But of course this is in vitro and you can uh, test like high concentrations of LPS or, and other bacterial cell wall components, but how relevant is that for the real life situation, right? So we wanted to go in vivo as well to see if there was still an effect of the skin bacteria on um, uh, virus infection in the mouse model. So for this we used the Zika virus mouse model and we gave the, the mice both uh, oral antibiotics because this was shown before by another team to have a big effect on a Zika virus disease in the mice. But we also affected um, the skin bacteria by uh, treating the food bath with a topical um, um, antibiotic cream. And this uh, cream contained uh, four antibiotics, so to have a broad spectrum effect on, on different bacteria. And after uh, seven days of um, treating the mice uh, food pots with this cream, we then infected this food pot with Zika virus and then followed up on, uh, on disease symptoms. And what we saw uh, very surprisingly uh, was that actually 
this uh, mice, the median survival was reduced with five days. So it was known for the oral antibiotics that they could do that, but not for the topical antibiotics. So if you depleted the skin bacteria, actually the mice got a worse uh, disease because of Zika virus. We also looked at the virus um, uh, genome in, and also infectious virus loads in the serum. Uh, and you can see here in, in, in orange uh, is the oral uh, treated group and in blue is the topically treated group. And we actually had a, the peak viremia uh, two days earlier than for the non-treated group. So it seems like the virus was disseminating faster um, to um, the serum and to other organs. And probably that's why the mice got sick um, um, more quickly. So we're doing a lot of experiments at the moment to try to figure out the mechanism. If it's really the skin bacteria, because it could also be some immune related uh, effects that are not uh, dependent on the bacteria. But at least it shows that it could be um, an interesting um, strategy for the future to look at how skin bacteria might be able to inhibit uh, virus replication. So with that, I, I come to uh, my conclusions. So uh, I think uh, it was clear that mosquito-borne viruses pose a worldwide threat for human health. And we don't have many uh, ways to um, combat these virus infections. So there is factor control, but there we have the problem of insecticide resistance. And there are vaccines, but not for all the, the arboviruses that are important. And we don't have any antiviral therapies available yet, but there are some inhibitors in clinical development, um, especially for dengue virus. For chikungunya, we only have this uh, monoclonal antibody that's being evaluated, but uh, there's, a, there's no other antiviral drugs actually being in development. But it would be better to actually have a broad spectrum antiviral drug because we cannot develop antivirals for all the mosquito-borne viruses that are important. So we can develop these antiviral drugs, but probably it will be difficult to use them in time because we cannot diagnose infections uh, in the acute stage. So I think we have to look at new strategies to um, uh, fight these arbovirus infections. And I think it's important to look at the mosquito because that's sometimes what we forget when we think about antiviral drugs. We're focused on human infections, but for arboviruses, there's also this mosquito factor that we need to take in, into account. And maybe in, in a far future, there could be live biotherapeutic products that might be uh, inhibiting um, the virus at the first stage of the replication in the skin. So with that, I would like to, to end uh, with, talking, uh, with thanking my team, which is shown over here. Um, also the people of the Ornets Lab at my university, um, with whom I collaborate a lot, and then uh, collaborators of, at Jans, uh, NCT Pasteur, and in Madrid, and the funding agencies. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So thank you very much. I had a question about sort of the mechanism of direct uh, toxicity on viral particles. I, so is, is the thought that these are sort of like either polysaccharide or I don't know if lipid A is included in that molecule that you're in, in the uh, component. Is, is that sort of direct insertion of the um, virion membrane or what do you think is happening? Yeah, so I, I will repeat the question. So the question is, what's the mechanism of the LPS in the, the direct viricidal effect? So actually, we don't know that yet. So what we are doing is we're now working together with a team in Belgium that can um, actually split the LPS in the different components. And then we will do, yeah, do these experiments again to see which part of the LPS, LPS is actually uh, having this effect because yeah we don't know at the moment but it is not an effect that we see with all LPS molecules so it, there is something specific but how it's actually working if it's really like binding to a certain viral protein or not yeah, we do see also differences between different viruses so it does seem to be something specific but yeah we cannot really say right now yes there's a few online first Sean Murphy says do you think that genetically engineered mosquitoes that are incapable of viral carriage are a reasonable path forward? Uh, sorry, uh, if it's a reasonable path forward, so okay, I will repeat the question again. So it's a, about genetically modified mosquitoes, it's a reasonable path forward. Well, I'm not an expert in, in genetically modified mosquitoes, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure if it's really um, something that will be durable, because you will have to, it will depend on the type of genetically modified mosquitoes. So you have several types that are developing, and some of them, they can, be, um, they can actually um, transfer this lethal gene to the next generation. So then you actually need to release this genetically modified mosquitoes only once at a certain location, and then it will be going on to the next population. So I think that would be a good strategy, but if it's something that it's, 
you have to release mosquitoes, but then the next generation you have to release them again because uh, the effect will not be transferred, then it will be difficult, I think, because the rearing of these mosquitoes, you have to have big facilities for that and then release thousands of mosquitoes to have your effect. So then it's probably not such a yeah, great way to move forward. Yeah. I'll wait to see if there are any questions here. Yes. <laughs> uh, Lane, great talk. Thank you. Um, so for the NSP1 inhibitors, um, even the pharmacology aside for now, can you rescue some of the effects by combining your different drugs? Would they become more potent and less resistant if you combine them? Yes, so the question is about the NSP1 inhibitors, if they would be, become more potent and less resistant development when they combine with other molecules. So me, you mean with molecules that have different mechanisms of action? or with possibly, the NSP Possibly with the same target, too. Yeah, yeah. We actually didn't try that yet, to do combinations. Um, I think it would certainly, for the resistance development, it would certainly help to, to not get um, such a... Especially with this MADTP molecule, it's within two passages we have full resistance, so that's really fast. So I think if we would combine it there with, a molecule, with another molecule, it would certainly help. And also towards potency. Actually, the CH3B molecules are quite potent already. They are in the nanomolar range as well. But uh, yeah, so it, I think it would make sense, especially for the first class. Yeah. So there's yeah. several from Susan Pink, and you might have to look at the computer to get them, because I'm not going to get them completely right. But so it says, so, great talk. Thank you so much. NS4B is such an interesting target. No enzymatic activity, right? Do the drugs block membrane localization? NS4B rearranges ER membranes. Do the drugs block this activity? And then she also says, regarding the microbial components, there is a report about peptidoglycan associated cyclic lipopeptide surfactant that can be found in the LPS preps and disrupts a variety of viruses. Do you know if this is in your active cell wall prep? Okay, so the first question is about NS4B inhibitors and whether um, what yeah, action of NS4B is being uh, targeted by the molecules. So um, it's actually the interaction between NS4B and NS3 that's being targeted. So it's not the membrane rearrangements, but uh, like the specific uh, interaction between these viral proteins, at least for the J and J molecule. Um, for the NITD molecule, I'm not sure how yeah, it's probably been um, characterized by the molecular mechanism, but I'm now I cannot remember exactly how it works. It's a different mechanism for sure. Yeah, but that uh, I don't remember. Then for the second question is about um, the LPS preparates. If there's like a, a surfactant of the peptidoglycans in there, well, we we bought the LPS um, preparates uh, like from companies. Uh, they should be quite clean, but of, yeah, we didn't test if that was there. Um, we didn't see the effect with all the LPS, so and we also didn't see much effect with the peptidoglycans itself. So I'm not sure if the surfactant would be in the peptidoglycan preparates itself as well, but there we did, didn't see so much effect. So, yeah, I cannot guarantee it's not there, but the fact that we didn't see it for all LPS, I think it's still... And there is also an, a difference between for certain LPS preparates, they were very active against Zika virus, but then they were not working so much against alpha viruses. So I would think if there would be a surfactant in there, it ha would have the same effect on, on these both types of viruses because they all have a membrane. So, yeah. Just two quick questions. First on the NS4, uh, NSP4, NS3B, or NSP, well, sorry. <laughs> I'll leave the word salad alone. Yeah. But do you see compensatory mutations in NSP3 to balance the, modif the mutations that you see in NSP4 that lead to drug escape? Um, so the question is about whether we see um, um, other mutations in NS3 that balance them for the effect in NS4B. We, no, we didn't find other mutations outside of the NS4B uh, gene, actually. And the other is a very sort of basic question. Um, my recollection from plasmodium is that you know, plasmodium infection reduces mosquito fitness with reduced egg laying. Do you see similar things with um, viral infection, sort of arbovirus infections writ large, or with sort of specific classes of MR? Yeah, so the question is about uh, the fitness of the mosquitoes when they are infected with an arbovirus, if fitness is affected. So that's not the case, actually. So the mosquito stays as fit as uh, if it would not be infected. So it keeps, so the mosquito is able to keep the infection quite low, but there's still enough to to reach the salivary glands and to get a transmission happening, yeah. Do they mount an immune response? Um, yeah, they do actually, but it's not so pronounced. So there are these, um, yeah, these um, 
kind of siRNA, pmeRNAs and so that are being uh, mounted when there's infection with an arbovirus, but they're not able to, to really uh, get the virus implication down in the mosquito. Yeah. So there's two more questions. I'm going to ask them at once because we're, we're at time. So is it known why different mosquito species carry different viral pathogens? And does that provide a clue for treatment or pathogenesis? And then can you comment about the development of resistance to antivirals? Yes, so the first question is about uh, whether it's known why different mosquito species transmit different viruses. So um, it's not really clear why that is. So we know that, um, for example, the uh, chikungunya virus is transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes, but there's a very similar virus, the Onyong virus, which is transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes, which are very different mosquito species. And actually the genome of these two, two viruses is very similar. So there are groups that are studying this and they made these chimeric viruses and even this could not really um, make the whole story clear. So they saw some difficulties in entry of these mosquito cells, but then also there was a defect at replication inside the cells of the mosquito. So it's not very clear what's, that's not like one part of the virus genome that's responsible for changing the, the mosquito species. So it's actually not well, well known why certain mosquitoes can um, transmit certain viruses. And the second question was about antiviral drug resistance for in general or in general? Oh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, <laughs> so of course for, um, um, for chronic viruses where you have a longer treatment, there's more chance of developing a resistant virus. And I think there's several, yeah, there's a lot of difference between antiviral drugs with regards to their resistance barrier. And of course, um, for um, these chronic infections, we usually use combination therapy of different antivirals because yeah, otherwise with the monotherapy, you do get easy um, drug resistance. But even for acute infections, like for influenza virus, you see, uh, like with Tamiflu, very quickly there's resistance. So also for acute infection, I think it's actually uh, would be best to combine uh, the different antiviral drugs to, yeah, to prevent uh, the resistance sele yeah, selection, actually. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>